right, so um, this is the next to last time we're going to be meeting um, as a class. Uh, next, the Wednesday after Thanksgiving is still an instructional day, but we don't have anything scheduled on the syllabus. So what we're going to be doing on that day instead, right, I'm going to do extended office hours. Um, so from 930, um, the Wednesday morning after Thanksgiving, I will be in the office if you, if you have questions about anything, if you want to come by and have me look at a paper or ask me about the exam or anything like that, right? So otherwise, yeah, we, just, we have one more presentation next Monday, right, on uh, human sacrifice in, in the Aztec and Maya culture. Yes, thank you, Caitlin. Um, fun stuff. <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, um, does anybody have any questions about the paper of the exam right now before we proceed? Okay, one thing that I've noticed, um, some of you seem to have a little trouble with on the quizzes, is keeping track of how characters are related to each other. So what I would suggest that you do, you know, sort of to help you for the exam, um, make charts when you're reading. Like make little family tree charts that show you like how various characters are connected to each other, right? So we know, for example, that, right, Sunjata is the son of <clears throat> Mayan Kanate and Sovalonkande. Right, and that his direct <coughs> siblings, right, his brother, Mandanbori, his sister, Kolon Khan, and there's another brother whose name escapes me at the moment, right? Now, the Madan Kanate also has other children by other wives, right? So, uh, by this woman, Sansun Berete, right, he has a son, Don Karan Tuman. Who's the guy who tries to who tries to kill Sunjata, right? The half brother who's jealous of him. What's that? Fakoli's not related to Sunjata, right? Fakoli's a different case. Fakoli, who's Fakoli related to? Yeah, Fakoli is related to Sumawaro, right? So, right? If Soso Sumawaro is the villain, and his sister is Fakoli's mother, right? From the same mother. So what does this mean is the relationship between, how do we define the relationship then between Fakoli and Sumawaro? Nephew. Nephew and uncle, right? On, and who's the connection through for Fakoli? His mother. His mother, right? Yeah. And Fakoli's mother and Sumawaro have the same mothers, right? They uh, are both uh, the product of a miraculous birth. Um, there's a part of the epic that's not here uh, included, in which Sumawaro took several years to be born because he kept jumping between the wombs of three different women uh, as a sort of mischievous trick uh, as a fetus. Um, so, yeah, he and Ficoli's mother have the same mothers. Um, now, what do we call this kind of relationship, just to review, in Mali culture? Badin. Yeah, that's a Badenya relationship, right? And Badenya means what? Mother kinship. Mother kinship. And what's its opposite? Fadenya, yes, father kinship. Good. And how are these two relationships different? One is wife and one is uh, friendship. Yes, and which is which? Mother is friendship and the father is father. Right, the mother relationship refers to a smaller group, right, a smaller family unit. Right, you share a mother with fewer people than you share a father with in a culture in which men can take many wives. So, children of the same father are rivals, right? Sunjata and Dankar and Tuman, for example, are rivals. Children of the same mother, 
right? Sunjata, Kolan Khan, Mandanbori, they are allies, right? They help each other. So that's why Fakoli sides with Sumawaro initially, right? It's because of that Badenya relationship, that relationship through the mother. Okay, so just to review a couple of other quick concepts um, that we talked about last time before we really sort of uh, get into this, just, you know, a couple of terms that we might want to try to remember here. Does anybody remember what a griot or a jelly is? Storyteller, right? Tradition, yep. West African traditional storyteller. All right, it's a combination counselor, praise singer, entertainer, and oral historian, right? They also uh, sort of keep the genealogy of the tribe. Now, if I add a W to jelly, what does that become? Yeah, it makes a plural. So when you see when you see a W added to um, a word in italics in the epic here, that just means it's plural, right? What about kumakoro? What does that mean? What's kumakoro? Yeah, yeah. Literally, it translates to ancient speech, right? What is this ancient speech. What is what does this mean more precisely? What is not quite. Um, what would be the Western equivalent of a kumakuro? Right. Yeah, Larry. Yeah, a kumakuro is the West African oral equivalent, right, of the Western epic. Right. As we, you know, as we noted last time, it's not quite the same thing. For one thing, it's oral, you know, it's still transmitted orally. Um, attitudes towards the past are different. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it deals with historical rather than mythological figures. Uh, but, yeah, in broad outlines, a kumakoro is very similar to an epic, right? What about sharifu? What are sharifu? Yep, this is the bloodline of the Prophet Muhammad. Okay, so Badenya, Fadenya, Kumakoro, Jeli, Sharifu, right? These are the big ideas that we covered uh, last time before I let you go. Um, so, do you guys have any questions about anything specific in the epic to start with? Yeah, Corey. Um, when she died, was there a reason? It just kind of like said she just died. Uh, yeah, there are probably narrative reasons for it. Okay. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, and it's also just you know she's she's probably pretty old at that point. So she, yeah, I mean, she simply dies of old age. But yeah, Daisha. Doesn't Kolokai curse um for like? Yeah, but that doesn't have anything to do with the mother's death. I'm, oh so, yeah, well, not about okay. the mother's death. I, I was separate from that. Okay. Well, well uh, okay. So we'll, we'll we'll get to that in a minute. We'll just we'll deal with the uh, the issue of Sogol and Kante's death. I think the death itself is less important than what the death sort of precipitates. Okay. Right. This exchange uh, with the king of Nema. Uh, if we look on page uh, 56, can I get somebody to read from about line uh, 1650, or Man and Bori took the path to town? Anybody? All right, Darpan, go for it. Man and Bori took the path to town. He said, Master, he said, my brother said that I should come and tell you that my mother is dead. If you agree, he used to give him land so he can bury his mother. Far and Tunkara had been unhappy to see the messengers come from Mandate. 
because from the time Sun Jata arrived up to that day, he did not engage in any battle that was lost by the people of Kunchoni. Every campaign he went on, he returned his slaves, but he could not detain Sun Jata because he came by his own choice. He wanted to start a quarrel so he could detain Sun Jata. Nima Faran Sunkara said, and then Bori, go and tell your brother that I, Nima Faran Sunkara, said that you did not bring a piece of land with you from Mandel, that I am the owner of this place, that you should take your cards, load it on the head and go to Mandel. Carry her back the same way you brought her. Tell him that if you bury her in my land, I'll post her in the world Okay, you can uh, stop this. Thank you. Um, so, <clears throat> what is Faran Sunkara's excuse here for not giving Sunjata the land? Well, that, that, that's sort of the motivation behind it, right? It's like, if this guy leaves, I lose a really good, valuable warrior, right? Um, but the excuse he's making here, right, is that um, this is all my land, right? So the land is sort of an extension of the king, right, of the Mansa. Right. If you want a piece of my land, right, you have to show proper respect to the king. Now, what is it that Sunjata and Mandanbori failed to do before they asked for the land? Yeah, they failed to observe this form of tradition, right, of giving the corpse to the king, right? It can only be buried in your land if the corpse belongs to you. Right, so it's a sort of measure of basic politeness. Right, courtesy. The brothers do not observe this form of courtesy. And so, Faran Tunkara becomes angry with them and refuses to give them the land until they do, right? They have to give him the corpse. They have to say, okay, this belongs to you, right? She's one of your people now. Before they can bury her and then go back to the Mandan, right? So the people, in a way, sort of belong to the king as well as the land. Um, and this is one thing to note also about this, you know, they keep talking about the Mandan throughout the epic. What is the Mandan? The people from um, one type of <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's okay. Um, yeah, it's a people, right? What else is it? Yeah, he's been, yeah, he's been kicked out because of his stupid brother, right? Um, it's a people, it's a place, right? The Mandan refers to the heartland of the Malinke people um, in sort of what is now Mali. It's sort of like in the, uh, the delta of the Niger River. So it's a people, it's a place, It's also a time. The Mandan is sort of the period of Sunjata's rule, right? The period that is initiated by Sunjata's rule. And what do we remember from last time about uh, the West African concept of history that's different from the idea of history that we're used to? That past affects future, or like future effect. Yeah, past, present, and future are all kind of collapsed into one, right? And they all affect each other, right? Things that happen today affect and change things that happened in the past. Things that, hap things that will yet happen affect the past, right? Um, there's a lot more interaction between past, present, and future than we are accustomed to uh, thinking of. So the Mandan then is a sort of consistent period. Like, you know, there will never not be a Mandan now that Sanjata has sort of declared and said, you know, declared it and set it down. Right, so this is sort of what we're talking about, like as, as far as the 
extension, the, the, the land, the kingdom, and the people as extensions of the king. Now, how does Sumawaro treat the people he rules? Yeah, he uses this relationship to abuse the people, right? What does he seem to be mostly concerned about? Killing Sunjata. Yeah, he wants to kill Sunjata, right? And why does he want to kill Sunjata? Because he says that he'll be the one to take over. Yeah, the told him that Sunjata would take over. Yeah, he's doing it to preserve his own power, right? So Sumawaro's primary concern is not with his people, it's with himself. It's with preserving his own authority. Um, if we look at, uh, on page 69, under uh, trading insults and swearing oaths, can I get somebody to read, uh, starting at line 2179, Mandan had mourned. Yeah, Ashlyn, go for it. Mandan had mourned after every battle against Sumawaro. He made all the women widows. He sewed shirts of human skin, the skins of the Monday and so people. He sewed trousers of human skin, the skins of the Monday and so people. He sewed a hat of human skin. After that, he sewed shoes of human skin. He summoned the people to come and give his shoes a name. Anyone who came, if the person said, Finfurina shoes, he would say, that is not the name. That is, yeah. If somebody said, Dulaburi, he would say, that is not the name. They asked him, all right, Sumawara, what are your shoes called? He said, my shoes are called Take the Air, Take the Ground from the Chief. People must always be around me, Sumawara. I will always keep Mandan in my power. That is the name of my human skin shoes. After they had made their preparations, the war began. Okay, you can uh, stop this. Thank you. Um, so the important thing here is what Sumawara is doing with the bodies of all of his subjects that he's killed, right? Yeah, he's disrespecting the bodies, and he's making clothes out of them, right? He's making himself, he makes himself a suit out of human skin. Early egg bean. Pardon? I said early egg bean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that guy was creepy. Yeah. Well, this um, is creepy. I mean, this is creepy, people, yes. And then he's skinning them and making uh -huh. shirts and pants and hats and shoes. Yeah. And just, like, look at my new suit. Uh-huh. In this case, like the idea here is a display of power, right? Yeah. I have power not only over the lives of my people, but over their very bodies, right? I can walk around wearing everybody's skin on my body because I'm that powerful. Now, does this seem to be um, an idea that the epic approves of? No. On the one hand, right, Sumawara is the bad guy, right? And this is, this is a pretty villainous thing to, to be doing, right? But Sumawaro represents, in the epic, a more barbaric past. Right, so even if it is by our standards, historically inaccurate to say so. Um, Sunjata is usually represented um, as Muslim and as sort of, you know, relatively forward thinking, right? So Sumawaro is the representative of the sort of opposing belief systems, right? Sumawaro is the representative of sort of that pagan past, right, where the chief is most concerned with asserting his authority. Right, this is the, the video he talks about, you know, my shoes are called, take the air, take the ground from the chief. People must, be, must always be around me, Sumawaro. I will always keep Mandan in my power, right? The point he's trying to make here is that this is my land, these are my people, and none of you are getting the hell away from me, right? Yeah, and this this is uh, the, uh, one of the issues with um, having to excerpt things uh, in an anthology. Um, this version largely leaves out 
how Sumawaro came to the Mandan in the first place. Like it says, like you said, that he came there like, that he's like, not, he's, he's, second, he's generation. Generation. second generation. He's yeah. He's not speaking out of that he was second generation mm-hmm. while he was eight. Yeah, Sunjata has you know, says he's got the pr- the prior claim here in the voting. I am an eighth generation um, Mande. You and your your you know your father came here as a supplicant to us, right? Um, so Sumawaro is a king of his own right of a neighboring kingdom. But yeah, um, Dankaran Tuman does become king after Sunjata's exile. But this leaves out the part where he invites. Sumawaro to help him with a problem, and Sumawaro just pushes him aside uh, because Dunkar and Tuman is weak and uh, takes over for himself, right? So he doesn't kill him, he just is just like. No, and this is, um, it's very rare that you'll see a major character in a Kumakuro be killed. There's a specific reason for this, right? All of the figures named in this epic, those who are verifiably historical and those who are not, are regarded as important ancestor spirits. Even Sumawaro, right? There are still people who bear uh, the Soso name um, in West Africa. And so, if you represent those people's ancestors being shamed or killed, you're bringing shame upon them. Right, you're embarrassing them in front of others. So generally, even if, even if, say, Sunjata did kill Sumawaro at that final battle, very few uh, Jelly, at least in a public performance, would ever actually say so. Because then that would um, provoke enmity between the Kaita Sunjata's clan and the Soso Sumawaro's clan, right? And even if it didn't do that, it would it would humiliate any Soso who happened to be listening, right? Reminding them that their ancestor was killed, that their ancestor was crushed and defeated. So, the way that this particular bard gets around. That problem is by having what happen at the end. Yes, Sumawara falls into the ravine, right? Yeah, and Sarah, what were you gonna say? Yeah. 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 Sunjata doesn't do it. Fakoli does it. And why is it more appropriate for Fakoli to do it? Yeah, because they're the same clan, right? They're the same family. They have that Badenya relationship. And why is Fakoli justified in breaking the bonds of Badenya here? Because he took, he took his wife. Yeah. yeah, Sumawaro unfairly took Fakoli's wife from him, right? Yeah, that she, she, she could that she could make as much food in one <laughs> pot as all of Sumawaro's wives, all 333 of his wives, could make in individual pots, right? So, yeah, he takes Fakoli's wife for himself. I don't really understand that, that part, how it went from 333 to 3. Uh, what do you mean 333 to 3? It says 300 wives and then 30 wives and 3 wives. Okay. 300, 300, 300, 300. <laughs> okay, it's, yeah, it's, it's 333 wives total, yeah. And okay. the, the number 333, the specific number 333 doesn't have any particular significance. Think of it like the thousand and one nights, right? Are there literally a thousand and one nights no. in that text? No. What does the thousand and one mean? Just yeah, it just means abundance, right? A lot, too many. <laughs> so the idea here is to show that Sumawaro has more than enough wives, right? He has an abundance of wives. What's that? The yeah, he's, he's very likely been taking wives from other people too, right? But yeah, the, the point is like just to go back to why Fakoli can kill Sumawaro and Sunjata can't, right? Is that Sumawaro has already violated the Badenya bond 
by disrespecting his nephew, by humiliating his nephew. And so Facoli is no longer bound by that. It's like, okay, right? You and my mother came from the same collection of wombs, and you're going to do that to me? Yeah. I'm going to kill you with my axe. Yeah, that's, that's how it goes. So this doesn't come out in this particular version of the epic either, but there is another issue uh, with Summa Waro. Now, our presenters last time talked a little bit about um, a caste system in uh, West African culture, right? Uh, particularly the culture of, uh, the, of the Mandate people. Um, you have nobles at the top. There are freeborn individuals. There are slaves who are not necessarily low status, though they are bound and can't leave. Um, and there are artisans. Now, again, like this isn't so much like a ladder of purity like the Hindu caste system is. It's in a lot of ways more kind of specialization of tasks kind of thing. There are certain tasks that you simply don't do if you're born into the wrong caste. Um, so if you're born into the noble caste, right, basically what's your job? To rule. Yeah. To rule. If you are born into the artisan caste, what's that? To create. To create. Yeah, you make things, right? You make things that are useful, right? So jelly are regarded as part of this artisan caste because they make songs and stories. Are they below slaves? Pardon? Are they below slaves? Well, because they're not really below. Um, it's not, it's, like I said, it's not really like a ladder in quite the, quite the same way. Um, artisans are actually uh, widely respected, but there are certain things they are not permitted to do, and they are often bound to a patron noble. Um, so jelly belong to this caste, and so do smiths. Right, now a lot of cultures, including the sort of the mandate culture, right, revere people who can, you, you know, who have the knowledge to use fire to shape metal, right? I mean, there's something almost magical about that. This is actually the caste that Sumawara belongs to. He's a smith. Again, because this is excerpted here, we don't really get this from, from the text we've got here. But yeah, Sumawara was a smith. So in becoming a chief, right, in taking over his tribe, he's actually already committed a pretty serious taboo. He's already broken a pretty serious taboo. No, um, and I think this is um, one of the things that is the key to Sumawaro's character, right, is this is a guy who doesn't much care about the rules. He will observe the form of the rules when he has to. Like, uh, you know, when he and Sunjata are exchanging courtesies before the battle, right? What does he offer Sunjata? Some snuff. He offers him a pinch of snuff, right? But it was poison. But it's, yeah, it's poisoned, right? So, ex you know, the two, le the leaders of opposing forces exchanging a little bit of snuff before the battle would be sort of, a, would be conventional, right? Would be, a, you know, a form of traditional politeness before you go off and start you know, trying to kill and capture each other. But Sumawara was even undermining that little ritual, right? By poisoning the snuff that he offers to Sanjata. Yeah? Is snuff like tobacco? Because what I've heard people call drink, they'll call it snuff, but then you have a line where he took it and he took it and he breathed it up his head and then he it's yeah. It's it's not tobacco. It's, it, tobacco's a north tobacco's a North American crop. I think it's um, like meth. Like, <laughs> meth. It's, not even coke. it's like coke. It would be. It would probably be more similar to something like uh, cocaine in its natural form, right? You know, um, 
Did, does anybody does anybody know what that is or where that comes from? It said there are workers uh, in like Inca workers in um, Western South America for years, just you know, as a stimulant, mild stimulant, would just chew coca leaves as they worked in the fields or whatever to keep themselves on their feet. Um, and cocaine is then sort of the distillation of that stuff that's in the coca leaf, right? It's like the pure stimulant that you then sort of inhale or smoke or inject or whatever, yeah. I think it's, I, I also thought it was cocaine, because not because it just sits up their nose, because he said he swapped it up his gums and didn't feel anything. And I watched yeah. this documentary, and like, that's how people tell if co cocaine is good cocaine, is if they pull in their gums and their gums go numb. Yeah. It's, like, yeah, um, it, it's probably not cocaine, because again, like, the coca leaf is a, uh, is a crop that is native to the Americas, mm -hmm. but it's something similar, right? The idea is, yeah, they, 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 it's this little stimulant drug that is exchanged um, in social situations. Yeah, so that, I mean, that, that, that's that's what snuff. It's yeah, it's, it's not it's not chewing tobacco. I was just confused because, like you said, um, they wouldn't have had muskets, so I'm like, well, they wouldn't have had chewing tobacco either. No, that's true. <laughs> I just, well, that's what I've heard people call yeah, it. Yeah, they, they wouldn't have had to, but yeah, um, and yeah, what, what we call snuff is not what most of the rest of the world refers to as snuff. All right, so speaking of um, people from the West not really getting it, um, I want to show you uh, a short clip of a performance uh, by Agrio. This guy, his, he's from Gambia. Um, his name is Papa Suso, and he's performing here at um, the at a community center in Richmond, Virginia. Um, now, one thing that I have to note about this before I start playing it. Um, okay, one of the big stereotypes about goofy white liberals um, is that one of our favorite things to do is um, dance aimlessly to world music that we don't really understand. <laughs> Um, and uh, this video is going to prove that stereotype largely true. Um, so, and, you know, I, I, I can say this is a representative of that particular group. Yeah, this is. Right. Uh, yeah, actually, I yeah, hit them both just so everybody can see.
Now, why does he keep shouting, everybody let's go? What is he expecting? The 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 yeah, these are usually like a performance by a griot is interactive, right? The audience is supposed to be responding in some way. Does this audience have any idea how to respond? No. <laughs> they give him money. <laughs> <They're> just, <laughs> yeah, they give him money or, or they clap along or, or this, guy, this guy just can't help himself. <laughs> Starts gro grooving in creepy ways, yeah. And uh, okay, that was actually what, it, yeah, what I wanted to get to next. Yeah, the instrument he's playing is called. Does anybody know what that instrument is called? Does anybody recognize it? Yeah. Okay. There's a mention of the Sumawara playing a lute, right? Now the lute that Sumawara was playing is probably something called the ngoni. And an ngoni, this is not an ngoni. An ngoni looks uh, sort of more like, it sort of looks more like a banjo. This is called a kora, K-O-R-A. And this is one of the sort of classic traditional griot instruments. What it is, um, it's, it's basically a harp, but it's made out of a, it's made out of a gourd. And you can see how he plays it, right? He grips the two handles in front of him, and his thumbs are moving at like lightning speed. Um, right? He's plucking individual strings really, really, really fast, and sometimes kind of sweeping across them. Um, the other traditional instrument uh, would be what's called a balafon. And a balafon is uh, it's a wooden xylophone. Now, Sumawara, we're told, has a balafone, right, in the epic. Now, this is not just something that's told to us just kind of for shits and giggles, right? Um, what this is is an indication of how wealthy and important Sumawara is, right? A balafone would be the most difficult and expensive of these instruments to produce. And so anybody who has a balafone is a person of great wealth and status. Now, there are also some jelly who um, have incorporated